do 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 I've decided I'm sick of lyrics. It's too hard to remember them when I have the camera on it. Easier to just make noises. It's a hot one here in Los Angeles, folks. Finally got it. I felt guilty all summer watching everybody else get owned by super high temps, but I was always, I always remembered. Memento Mori was like, it's coming for you. September is the month, the cruelest month uh, down here in Southern California, and I'm feeling it, but I'm all right. I got my uh, Polar Black Cherry, which for my money, uh, the best of the seltzers that's the flavored seltzers also apparently one of the ones with the highest amount of uh impurities or something right behind topo chico which will apparently give you kidney stones or something i don't know okay so today we're going to talk first Again, probably won't talk too long because we haven't gotten to the meaty stuff yet, which is going to be about America in the second half. Right now, we're still setting up Lachman in this book here. First Class Passengers on a sh Sinking Ship by Richard Lachman. We're setting up his concept of hegemony, how it is established, and specifically why it declines. And because Lachman is a uh, fucking academic's academic, uh, before he even gets to examining any of his hegemons, or would-be hegemons. By the way, thank you to everybody who sent me The Last Valley. Apparently there's an HD version on YouTube, which I will be watching probably tonight. Thank you very much. I'm very excited about it. It is astoundingly, it's like basically the only 30 Years War movie that anybody ever bothered to make. I mean, maybe there's some obscure shit I'm not aware of, but uh, beyond that, like that's really the only one. Uh trying to think of anything else that even comes close. Not really anything. Um, but anyway, back to Lachman. Um, so in the second chapter, Money and Military Success, 1518-15, he takes all of the rival theories of hegemonic decline that exist sort of in the ether and in the academy and in popular understanding and scholarship and breaks down exactly why they ain't shit and vastly inferior uh, to his own concept. Have I read Wilson? Have I read this bitch? You bet I have. Which, by the way, I don't recommend anybody read this. No one needs to know the shit in this book. Read Wedgwood. If you want to read a one-volume thing of the, of, the, of the Thirty Years' War that'll get you like a lot of the flavor of it and the interesting... Uh, you know, arcs and, and allow you to, and, and, and as an entrepot to, you know, if you get the virus, the nerd virus and want to read more about it as a, as a, a like give you, you know, access to the uh, rabbit holes for you want to go down to read Wedgwood shorter, much more uh, uh, literary. I mean, you know, she was a thirties historian when, when they actually cared about having things, uh, you know, having, uh, prose that actually was fun or interesting or aesthetically pleasing to read. Wilson is... The thing about this book, this is the wildest shit to me. 
if anyone has read this, this is like the uh, the modern sort of capstone, like, okay, you want to know what happened in the 30 Years' War? Read this one. And it does have everything, you know? It's huge, and it's got the whole war. But the premise of the book, such as it exists, is that the 30 Years' War wasn't actually that big of a deal. It didn't do really that much to any of the... Uh, uh, to change any of the structures of Europe at the time. Uh, and, uh, and then, in addition to that, the, Habs the uh, Holy Roman Empire actually gets a bad rap as a dysfunctional political organization because it was working pretty well until the entire uh, continent burst into flames. And it's kind of baffling to me that you would write a book about uh, this long, about that subject, with like the desire to basically get people to stop talking about it. <laughs> Very weird. He's English. They're freaks. English historians, absolute mutants. Uh, but yes, if you want a one volume, you're not going to get all the nitty gritty details like where all the armies went and all that stuff. But I'm here to tell you, having read a bunch of those books, that shit just absolutely goes in one ear and out the other. And it doesn't really add to anybody's understanding of anything. You've got to be one of those military historian types who like fixate on tactical movements to find it in any way interesting and yeah like that's the stuff that i think i i got into as a kid as a civil war as an american civil war nerd but you know you're supposed to move beyond that i honestly feel like if you still fixate on on that element as an adult you're kind of refusing to grow up okay so Latchman is going to go through these other concepts of hegemonic design or hegemonic decline and basically point out how they do not actually answer the question of how hegemons de decline and therefore are inferior to his own model, which he will advance in the subsequent chapters. Uh, and so the, he goes through four basic analytical frameworks. One is decadence, the classic hard times make uh, strong men, strong men make good times, Good times make weak men. Weak men make hard times cycle. The, the Joe Rogan uh, Facebook potted history that is sort of like the background radiation of like reactionary historical understanding, you know, uh, moralizing and, uh, and power serving. And the section here where Lachman, he really goes hard against these guys, especially Niall Ferguson, who gets owned pretty good in, in this section. Uh, where he just points out, you know, that there's absolutely no uh, analytical rigor to any of this. It's, it's, it has no, it, it offers no mechanism. And it also includes just absolute fraudulent uh, information. Uh, for example, Niall Ferguson, talking about American decline, claims that it's because we don't have the guts to actually own our imperial designs and create, like, crops of dedicated civil servants who will go around the world, like, the uh, and and assert American hegemony the way that the Raj, the, the British did with the Raj in the 19th century. Uh, and that the reason we do, we're, uh, we're failing to do that is partially because we're spending too much damn money on Social Security and Medicare and not enough on military. Uh, and Lachman shows pretty quickly, like, well, that's completely made up. Like, uh, social expenditure has not really gone up in 40 years. Uh, what has happened is that tax revenue has collapsed. And that, he doesn't say it, but I mean, I know enough from reading other things from Lachman and from, uh, you know, reading the beginning of this book and his specific theory of uh, elite conflict within polities causing them to not be able to function at the capacity that they might theoretically have, uh, that that's a result of elite meddling and elite conflict. That No, 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 we're not going to pay to maintain the, the, the uh, hegemony that benefits us. And there's no central authority that can make us. So those guys out the window, fuck you, you suck, idiots, obviously. Uh, then you've got demographic and ecological explanations for decline. Uh, he, he name checks Jared Diamond in this, but most of those theorists aren't talking about modern hegemons and don't really have anything to say about modern hegemonic decline. Uh, and there hasn't a lot of actual work done to compare demographic or ecological conditions. Uh, there is a theory of, of, of that a population, uh, that population growth beyond you know its uh, stable point 
uh, is undermining, but that doesn't really, you don't really see that, or at least Lackman implica- implies that you don't really see those sort of demo- uh, demographic pressures in these cases of actual hegemon- uh, hegemons that decline, which means that's not responsible for a hegemonic decline. Uh, then he goes uh, more, much more respectfully, he addresses world systems theory, Matt Wallerstein and Arigi, and he says world world systems theory has a lot to uh, recommend it as a analytical framework for understanding how capitalism specifically uh, operates on a global scale, but it is very vague on internal dynamics within hegemonic polities. And so it is unable to answer questions of decline because it does not specifically address those. Uh, and then for the, and then in the fourth uh, ch- chunk of this, the final chunk of the, of the second chapter, he takes uh, people to task who, uh, whose theory of state power and, and, and uh, hegemonic dominance and then decline revolves around uh, pure just material access, material resource access. Uh, the states that are able to access the most funds and are able to operate from the, the highest material condition uh, are able to dominate until uh, the second and third rate powers gang up on them and then they decline. Uh, but uh, with a number of very convincing charts at the end of the chapter, Lackman points out that that's not really the case historically. There are tons of examples from the mer- early modern era on of the largest, most powerful, richest states getting their asses kicked in colonial and, and continental wars by much smaller powers. Uh, and in, in, in some cases, smaller powers punching way above their weight, and you don't necessarily see a dynamic of cooperation against a hegemon so much as a hegemon just failing to access its theoretical state capacity. And so Latchman ends the chapter like, okay, so why then did these, did the first attempted hegemons of the early modern European era Habsburg Spain, and then uh, Bourbon France, and then Napoleon later, who made it, gas, grasped for hegemonic power, were for a moment the apex, most powerful, most rich polities in Europe, but were, and were able to build significant colonial empires, but could never actually achieve hegemony and ended up declining in the face of Dutch and then English power. And so to answer that question, we turn to this chapter three. Uh, fuck, I didn't write down the name of chapter three because I'm a dumbass. Why didn't I do that? I'm so stupid. Uh, chapter three, Spain and France, military dominance without hegemony. So he starts with the Spanish Habsburgs. We all love the Spanish Habsburgs, don't we, folks? First off the gate, create this massive, uh, incredibly rich American colonial empire, but as soon as it, almost as soon as it's built and starts pumping unprecedented amounts of silver into the European economy, uh, it begins the process of undermining and dooming uh, the Spanish Spanish power. And you look at the resources they had to access, and you say, how did that happen? And Lachman's answer is it, it comes down to the specific array of forces and powers that dominated in Iberia when the colonial project began. Specifically, the fact that the royal power that eventually was able to claim united control of the Iberian Peninsula after uh, the Portuguese War in the 1580s, uh, the Habsburg monarchy there, uh, was only able to gain that preeminence by striking deals with the regional military aristocrats who had done the actual work of reconquering the peninsula from uh, Muslim powers. Uh, like th- th- that is the specific context of Spain, is that it, w- it had the historical reality of having been dominated by Muslim emirates, which over years were pushed back, but pushed back by local Catholic, Christian Catholic warlords who were able to es- exercise military dominance in their regions. Uh, and that the Trastamaras and then the Habsburgs who came after them were only able to sit atop power in Spain by granting essentially regional autarky 
to the military aristocrats of Spain at the expense of the peasants and the towns uh, because they essentially did not have, uh, the, the, the royal family didn't have a independent power base to countervail that author the power of the aristocrats and essentially had to sign off on their power. That, that's the reality of these dynastic uh, struggles and, and the rise of these dynastic families in the early modern era atop these new powerful states is that they got there largely not through conquest within their polity, but by uh, acceding to the existing power structures that existed locally. And in Spain, that meant these autarkic military aristocrats. And an autarkic, autarkic military aristocrats aren't big on giving uh, money to a central government to create independent bureaucracy uh, to extend state capacity at their expense, at the expense of their private power, which meant that when it was time to actually administer these colonies that they had established in the Middle East and Asia, they were forced to recreate feudalism in the American context rather than impose a state project of extraction there. Uh, if anybody knows from, uh, from junior high history, the encomienda system. Everybody knows the encomienda system. Anyone? Encomienda. And that was uh, a system whereby, because the state didn't have the capacity to actually settle and dominate and impose its will in the new world, uh, it gave land grants and, more importantly, the grants to the labor of all of the natives found on that land to uh, the aristocratic and, uh, but not all aristocratic, many of them commoners just, you know, trying to raise up in the world, who uh, went over there and actually did the, 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 the work of the crown of spreading Catholicism and, and Habsburg rule there. Uh, and what that meant is that while there was a system to send silver, send money, send the fruits of a trade back to Spain, uh, over time Spain got a smaller and smaller percentage of the wealth made in the colonies because the local powers there, the, the encomienda uh, rulers, became their own autarkic aristocratic uh, barons who were, were jealously guarded it, kept it home, defied the mercantile demand to only sp trade with the Spanish crown. Uh, and while the, port of, the, the, the city of Seville became the entrepot for all uh, New World trade, uh, they were never able to the, the, the Seville traders were never able to assert control over the producers in the colonies the way that uh, the Dutch, the, the way that the trader, the merchants of uh, Amsterdam and London were able to do for the later uh, hegemonic colonial empires. Uh, and you get a situation eventually where Spain sends colonial administrators from the metropole to the colonies who then have to contend with these deeply embedded local power structures where uh, American Spanish aristocrats are sitting on top of existing networks of like native social structure that they have uh, command of and access to the resources of. Uh, and the colonial administrators basically just have a piece of paper with the king's signature on it, which you know in the jungles of uh, Venezuela doesn't really uh, put, go very far. And so you have this push and pull between the colonial elites and, uh, and uh, imperial officials. Uh, meanwhile, you have fortunes being, ma vast private fortunes of, tit of, of, of Spanish subjects being built in the New World, giving those fortunes influence back in Spain. And you have this dynamic occur where the colonial power, the colonial the elites, the new colonial elites are able to assert more influence in the metropole of Spain, in Madrid, than the metropole is on the colonies. And that means that even though there's this vast wealth being pulled out of the ground in Latin America, it's mostly staying in Latin America. It is not going to the uh, 
funding of state capacity that could have created what they call that virtuous cycle uh, that builds up uh, a, a state capable of not only defending its territories, but defending its geopolitical status in Europe among its rivals. And so you have Spain being the subject of every other major power in Europe's uh, fear and suspicion. Uh, you see this group, these cycling of uh, alliances against Habsburg Spain that run all the way through the Thirty Years' War. They're, swat, they're getting swatted by everybody. They're, they're like an elephant getting stabbed by a thousand uh, spears. They can't even fucking put down the Dutch Revolt, which is just this fraction of their population with a fraction of their resources. Because all the resources are just bleeding away because they don't have the capacity. And what does that boil down to? The fact that the entire Spanish state structure was premised on this uh, network of independent, basically, aristocrats who had no individual interest in seeing the crown really advanced. And so that Spain became un incapable of defending its own power. And soon enough, the French were able to overcome them. Uh, the Thirty Years' War is a big part of that. That really does help put significant... Uh, uh, Richelieu and the French are able to use their diplomatic uh, skills and their vast resources, because they're the other richest country in uh, Europe at the time, to isolate the Spanish and to eventually see uh, a large part of their territory, their not, uh, not their New World uh, colonies, which are largely left alone, but a large chunk of their European uh, empire uh, take it, pulled away from them. Uh, simultaneous revolts in Portugal and Catalonia that lead to Portugal permanently re-detaching from the Iberian Union. And, I mean, and it was not that the Spanish crown was not aware of this. Count Duke Olivares, who was the min chief minister of Louis the, uh, Philip IV, made an attempt to centralize authority in Spain. This, uh, the, the Union of Arms in 1625, that was an attempt to actually make every elite within Spain responsible for Spain's military uh, success. Make them all have to fucking kick in. But they, of course, resisted it, uh, retreated to their regional strongholds, and undermined the authority of the, of the royal family at every turn. So, although the Habsburg state was precocious relative to other states in its power and capacity in the 1500s, by the end of the 17th century... Uh, they have entered into uh, a irreversible decline, which is picked up then, uh, which gives the option then for the French, who after uh, the Fronde is put down, which is their own revolt, because they spent a shit ton of money and alienated their own elites to try to defeat the Spanish, which led to their own peasants and aristocrats to revolt at about the same time. Uh, but in their case, that led to the triumph of the uh absolute state in the person of King Louis XIV, who is able to centralize authority in the crown. But how does he do it? He does it in a way that, yes, uh, uh, firmly establishes royal prerogative over the hexagon, but does it at the expense of di the dynamism and, uh, and ability to, ex uh, to effectively extract resources uh, that would have allowed them to continue to successfully compete with the other European powers. What, what uh, Louis does is that he uh, keeps the elites within France, the aristocrats, the towns, you know, the, the landowners, uh, from unifying against the royal family and, and, and making them all reliant on the royal family by making the most lucrative path of uh, investment, and, and the most lucrative thing to do with your money if you were a elite in France, to purchase a state office. And state offices become the object of competition among the imperial, uh, the French elite. Now that does secure Louis, you know, he builds Versailles, he, he makes all the uh, high aristocrats move from their homes 
their chateaus and spend a zillion dollars living in Versailles and hanging out at his garden parties and putting on arsenic-based makeup and calling each other whores or whatever the hell, doing, doing uh, bants and zingers, just trying to stay, stop dying from boredom before they die of syphilis. But it comes at a cost. And what that cost is is that when France is able to, uh, coming in late, but uh, so France is able, they, they, they have to come from behind because the, at the exact same time that uh, like Caribbean and, and Latin American colonies are becoming like really lucrative is when the French wars of religion are basically making it impossible for the French to commit to any kind of uh, uh, real colonial uh, policy. Only after the wars of religion end are they able to actually seriously try to start uh, a colonial enterprise. But the, incite, the incentive to invest in colonies is undermined by the fact that for the colonial elites of France, or for the, uh, for the, uh, the economic elites of France, the highest return for any, of any money is going to be to buy offices. So that means that uh, French colonies become wildly undercapitalized. They end up having to depend on Europe, on English and Dutch and Portuguese trade routes, slave networks to to get labor for their colonies uh, and to get to get the resources out of their colonies. So they end up having to sell, for example, a lot of their Caribbean sugar to Dutch middlemen, and then give up, therefore, a bunch of the profits to the Dutch just to get it off the island because they lack of. Uh, the lack of capital in investment in the colonies. And of course, we're only really talking about the Caribbean ones because Canada was always a money loser from day one. No, Canada never made money. And part of this is because one of the things you get from a, uh, you, you can get from a colony and a thing that the British ended up getting, and a thing that helped the British leapfrog over the rest of these guys, we'll talk about that in future uh, chapters, is if, if you can create a uh, colonial market for metropolitan uh, manufactured goods that that is a vast math that is a huge economic stimulus and uh, that was never built in any of the French colonies the richest French colony of course was saint domingue Haiti where all the money was kept by a very small group of uh, ultra rich planters who spent it on luxuries much like they did in the south of the United States, which is not what you want. The, 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 the vast majority of Haitians were slaves who didn't have any consumption. They weren't buying shit. Having, uh, having colonials buying stuff from you, having your colonials buy the product of your shop houses and workhouses and, and your trade networks is a huge boon to act the economy and a huge... Uh, source for state revenues that you can use to fight the other fucking European states. And the French were just unable to harness their colonial powers until they got lapped by the, Sp the, the Dutch and the British and then, the the, and then had it basically taken from them. First, with, uh, first by losing Canada in the Seven Years' War, and then, of course, uh, losing Saint-Domingue and the Caribbean, most of the Caribbean holdings during uh, the, after, with the Haitian Revolution and the, and the Napoleonic Wars. Now, the French do come back under Napoleon and make a grab for hegemony that is spectacularly successful in the, in the short run and that absolutely destroys all those old uh, barriers to effective state capacity. The, the, the Napoleonic Empire uh, is not one with independent sources of power. Th those have all been wiped away by the guillotine and by the French Revolution. Uh, and, and a military aristocracy, basically, a, a meritocratic, liberal military aristocracy governs the entirety of the Napoleonic Empire. But, and, and in, in that way, it... it uh, 
it shows the only like effective way that any power could feasibly assert continental hegemony uh, and the way that Hitler tried to assert continental hegemony uh, 100 so years later. But a, con a permanent conquest regime in the modern era is simply not feasible in the long run or even in the medium run. And so Napoleon got got, and that's the end of France's uh, plays for hegemony. So you got these two states, one that got there, that started building an empire early, built an incredibly wealthy, uh, resource-rich empire, but didn't have this, the state structures capable of turning that into hegemony. And then the French, who had uh, more, they had, they have always been the richest, most populous, most agriculturally bountiful European polity. Yeah. And that's geographic, that's largely a geographic uh, response because of that, like I called it the hexagon earlier. They call France the hexagon sometimes. It's fully, it has natural borders all around it, basically. Uh, and within those natural borders, you have this just vastly uh, rich agricultural territory which in its own way helped retard France's um, uh, uh, economic growth. But all, of, but one of the, and, and uh, cap capitalism doesn't really catch on in France the way that it does in Spain, uh, in large part because independent individual uh, legally recognized land tenure which becomes the cornerstone of uh, the European politi the British political economy that ends up dominating the world, cannot really be asserted in France until the revolution uh, because of these competing uh, elite networks, all of whom are making claims, uh, historical, feudal, uh, rights-based claims on resources and on state offices, which does not allow for the uh, centralized administration of private property. And that is the key to the British. Brenner, I think, is, is, is... I honestly don't get that there is a necessary conflict between Brenner and Wallenstein at the end of the day, because I feel like the Brenner explanation for how capitalism begins with land tenure in the British countryside is correct. But how it spreads and how it becomes dominant in the world I think has never been more well elucidated and explained than through Wallenstein and Narigi and the world system stuff. So I don't know why they got to fight. So these, so in that chapter, we are dispensed with these two forces that materially should have been able to assert continental hegemony, but just weren't able to do it because of the nature of their elite institute, their, uh, the nature of elites within their country and the, co the competitive framework that it can never be resolved from the center. So uh, next week, we'll talk about the next two chapters, which are about two hegemons that actually were able to establish, or would be hegemons, that actually are able to do it. Briefly in the case of the Dutch, much longer in the case of the English, but in both cases, eventually brought down, eventually humbled. Although not in the way, obviously, that they deserved, you know, like considering the worldwide monstrous bloodletting that goes into building a hegemon like that. Uh, by all rights, the Dutch and the English shouldn't exist as people. Uh, but, you know, hey, you don't get justice in this world. And we'll be talking about that uh, next week, those two chapters. And then after that, we will get to the second half of the book, which is all about applying this concept of elite conflict leading to hegemonic decline to the contemporary United States. So, uh, so let's take some questions now for maybe a half an hour or so, if any of that made sense. I do like it. It's academic. He's a, he's, you know, the man's clearly an academic, so it's a little dry, but it reads very quickly. He doesn't use the. He doesn't get lost in his clauses the way a lot of academics do. Uh, but it's a very. Um, he he is so focused on applying like the analytical framework and the lens to everything, that it makes reading it very. 
it makes like getting his point as he's as he's making it very easy because uh, because he's not letting anything like kind of extraneously just go un uh, not put not put through, nothing go nothing is uh, nothing doesn't get put through the ringer you know uh, of his the analytical framework so I like it I did not see Brandon's speech. Uh, the fact that people are shitting them pants because of the fucking picture of him with, with like red lighting is hilarious to me. You could not, I'm sorry, man. If you're laughing at January 6th and saying it's, uh, it's, it's hilarious watching liberals cry over it, which yes, it is. You cannot start wetting your pants because some of the most tedious dorks in, uh, Washington, D.C., decided it would be epically uh, hilarious to take their 90-year-old, fossilized, senile, quote-unquote, boss and set him up for a fucking meme uh, speech and photo opportunity. I mean, just show some fucking self-respect. Good Lord. Nothing has changed about Brandon. He is the same uh, doddering doofus he's always been. Because these guys figured out a way to just repeat the same uh, cringe-inducing meme bullshit that the, the Trump people did, all of a sudden, you have to be afraid of him? I mean, my God, if you don't want more evidence that these people are mirror-fucking images of each other, that there is no difference between any of them. And I, the thing that really makes them no... By the way, the thing that actually makes there no real practical difference between either of these groups of people is that they're both voting for parties... Because all of this, all of this strum and dong, all of this shit, all, all these, all of it is just to reassure one group or another of people who vote Democratic or Republican. Both parties have a long-term teleology towards nuclear war with China. The only question, the only real difference between these two parties is which coalition they imagine going to war with China with. Now, yeah, like you got the anti-war, uh, you know, geniuses who've decided that the that Trump Republicanism is some sort of antidote to uh, militarism, LOL. But every single one of them will tell you that, like, if they hate, if they're against the war in Ukraine and America supporting it, it's because that's taken the bot, the the eye off the ball, vis a vis China, and because they think we should be aligning with Russia against China. The fantasy is that you can cut off Globo Homo and have a, uh, a new coalition of based white republics uh, go to war with China on behalf of, like, a white world supremacy. Which is, you know, that's insane uh, death drive mania. But the, the democratic response is, no, no, no. Uh, it's the U.S. and, e and the EU uh, against China and Russia. But either way, it's a war with China. Just a question of the alliances behind you when it happens. So, like, there's no, there's no side here that's going to rescue you from the worst outcome. There's no side here that's going to provide a harm reduction, which both sides love to talk about. Um... Uh, yeah, somebody keeps asking about the Pakistani floods. Man, that's... Whoo! Boy. Not good. That's for sure. I don't know what the fuck else you're supposed to say about it. Uh, I mean, when you, th when you consider a thing like that, I think the only... The only way to really, like, stay sane is to... Uh, take the long view, you know, to, to try to get your way personally to whatever, through whatever Kubler-Roth cycle you own, you have, whatever, whatever fantasy you might have been clinging to of personal immortality or, uh, or uh, social transcendence, and just know, you know, like, everything is cycl cyclical, nothing is permanent. I mean, I don't. Ha I do not have any hope that like horrors like that are going to spur any kind of like real reconsideration of uh, 
of the global political economy. I mean, that is the conceit of Ministry of for the Future, right? That like 10 million people die in India and it actually makes people start taking things seriously. I mean, 80% of livestock in Pakistan dying. I don't see it making any, anybody take anything seriously. And yeah, there's Chinese heat wave that basically went uncommented upon. The, we, we are too, we are in a horrifying situation where we are fully uh, aware of almost all the horrors in the world. At a, at a finger, at a, at, at a few keystrokes, we can have access to all the world's horrors. And we can be aware of how they connect to one another and how we, they connect to us and our lives and how we benefit in some abstract way from, from the things as they, as they are. But we have absolutely no individual ability to do anything about them, which is a, a situation that nobody in history has ever had to deal with. Previous people have gone through apocalyptic cycles of decline, but never with some sort of understanding of it being a totalizing phenomenon. But yeah, I mean, things are going to get worse, obviously. But we're all, y'all still just got to live, man. Fuck. I don't know. You can't use it as an excuse, is I guess the only thing that I think of. Because you don't help anybody. You know, using it as an excuse to, to destroy yourself or to not extend yourself to other people, to, to, not, to not reach out, to not make an effort... Uh, that's only shortchanging yourself and only robbing the time you do have, that we all have, of the, p the potential for meaning. But yeah, it's certainly horrifying. Yeah, the one thing that you, 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 nobody is going to get is, is some clean break that allows them to, uh, to not have to be with themselves anymore, you know. You're going to be there no matter what. And so you have to decide what that means, who you are. And that is something that we have control over, even though, you know, every institution and every, uh, social phenomenon of life kind of insists that the opposite is true, that we are these reified beings who are kind of doomed to cycles of uh, misery. And I think you need to do that because the big thing that I am... The big thing that, that this makes me despair about the American spe uh, situation specifically is that people don't have any, obviously, faith in the future or in each other or in government to do anything for them. But we still do all know, just by our day-to-day -day experience, that power resides somewhere and that there is the power of life and death that can be exercised, but only to punish. And... What I think we're, we're going to be looking at in the future here is this cyc these cycles of punishment and scapegoat seeking to, to amongst those people who are still like cleaving to politics as a solution, it can only solve things by providing that sort of ritualized catharsis, not by uh, solving any problems. But, you know... That doesn't feed anybody, and people are still going to be hungry, so.
I got to say, uh, Bolsonaristos in Brazil in general taking a huge L that some guy doesn't even remember to put a bullet in the gun. What the hell happened? He, like, had the safety on or something? My guy in Japan fucking built his own functioning trebuchet to kill the fucking former prime minister. Bolsonaristos blown the fuck out. I don't know. I mean, I can see it. Like, you say, why would he want to shoot the... Why would a Brazilian guy want to shoot Krishner? I mean, the whole... Like, the, the Brazilian right is like our right. They're all beset by paranoid fantasies of being encircled. I mean, and in their case, like, you know, Brazil is at this point encircled by uh, more leftist regimes anyway. Uh, apparently, he's a rockabilly, too. I saw a picture of the guy. Ooh. The Brazilian teddy boy Greg trying to kill the vice president. Embarrassing. He put the bullets in backwards? Jesus Christ. Jesus fucking Christ. How do you, how do you fuck that up? The bu okay, so this, that honestly makes me think it's a Bob Roberts situation, and the whole thing was a setup to boost the Kirshners. And uh, the, 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 that wing of the Peronist uh, movement. In which case, hey, well done. Like, I don't, you, you got to do what you got to do. You know, you can't be squeamish at this late date. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can't, yeah, everything is a, everything is a hall of mirrors and shadows. No, there's no way to assert any confidence in the truth of anything. I mean, obviously, we've always been living in fabricated realities, but if everybody sort of has a base commitment to the fabricated reality, it transcends the fabrication and becomes material and true. Uh, and that, that is what is fraying. That is why to be incredibly uh, dorky about it and uh, cringe, the only answer to any of these questions is, is love in any form you can find it because it's the only thing that can't be fabricated because it is not received intellectually and processed intellectually the way that our consensus reality is. It is perceived and processed emotionally. It, it arises from uh, experience, the whole of experience, not just a, uh, a abstracted thread of symbolic representation of experience. Man, Europe this winter. England, ooh, I don't know how the Brits are going to handle that. But they, the, the thing about the Brits, though, is that they're sickos. They love that shit. Like, they all wish it was the Blitz because that was the last time they had fucking purpose. That was the last time they had any goddamn purpose and meaning in their lives. Or, or they imagined that that was the case. Of course, none of them actually lived through it. It's a fantasy of, of meaning through collective suffering. But, of course, it is not collective suffering. It is only individualized suffering happening at the same time.
Will the UK end in the next 10 years? I mean, I think this winter is going to be a real stress test. <laughs> we'll see. Where does power exist now? I think the reason we're all freaking out so much is that power has, has vacated human, human agency. Power no longer resides in human agency. There are people in positions of power, obviously, and those positions of power have more concentrated power over the world than has ever existed in any concentrated form in human history. But the power resides not in the office holder, but in the office. The person in the room, the person in the chair is completely fungible. And I think that is a new, that is a, that is a new, uh, That is a new arrangement in human affairs that is only made possible because of our technological social structure. Now, of course, theoretically, power, we have all as humans the power to pull this whole thing down and to get into the T-800 and change its programming. Oh. We would have to believe that, and we would have to believe in each other to act to make that happen. And once again, that belief is not going to come from uh, uh, some consensus understanding of events. It's going to come from experiential love, alloying, and, uh, and, and cycling up um, within people cooperating together. People are talking, I gotta say, I gotta wonder about the China. Everyone say, you know, people talk about blessed Chairman Xi saving us and all that, but uh, it does not seem like they really have a plan either. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if they were creating, you know, a uh, this Belt and Road Network and and, and the, the state party is, is still has the whip hand vis-a-vis uh, -vis this all these you know public private enterprises but it, it still is caught in this cycle of in order to maintain its legitimacy needing to offer middle class lifestyles to a population that cannot possibly live that way Yeah, like if the Chinese inherit the world, it's not going to be the whole world. It's just going to be the, wherever they can uh, project power in a context of completely failed supply lines. And at that point, can you have a can you maintain a central authority, or do you lose the mandate of heaven? I don't know. Uh, everything is fucked. Everybody sucks, as uh, the bard himself, Frederick Durst, once said. But that's fine. We're all here right now. Nobody in this chat is currently uh, in hysterical misery. At least I hope not. If you're in hysterical misery right now, you should probably be doing something else. Uh, unless this is distracting you from that, in which case, happy to help. Okay, so, oh, somebody asked about hell, hell on Earth. Good, I have a couple of plugs. One is, of course, for the podcast, which will come out in the fall. We're shooting for maybe November. We want to get it out before the beginning of the, for the, before the end of the year, but we'll start. We have about half of it written and, uh, and the first four recorded, but not fully, you know, edited or whatever. 
Uh, so we're on a good pace. I think it's going to be very good. I'm very proud of it. Uh, but the other one is that next Thursday, I, it'll probably be around 6 Eastern. We'll see, though. Uh, I am going to be playing on Twitch here uh, Europa Universalis with some very friendly nerds who are very good at it and have offered their help in leading me through a campaign. So uh, we'll probably do something uh, 30 Years War related, you know, like maybe uh, maybe try to unify Germany before it can fall apart. We'll see. I don't know. Maybe maybe try to like be, get Prussia to exist early. I don't know. We'll see. I've always kind of wanted to see how far you could push the uh, Venetian Republic. Like, could you could you could you get Venice to like hold together and become uh, an independent power that is able to prevent? The Italian wars from basically destroying all of those uh, uh, early capitalist uh, nodes that had been built, and and pushing uh, the uh, pushing the focal point of British or, or of European like trade and and manufacturing uh, up north into the Low Countries in England. Good old Doge Dandala. Motherfucker was 95 years old when he led the when he led the Crusaders into Byzantium. I don't know. I'll probably get owned and it'll be very frustrating. But we'll see. I've just I've been wanting to play one of these with somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, and they, they look like they can help me out. Oh, I will certainly try to ignore the chat. Oh, I don't know if I'm watching that Lord of the Rings thing. Tolkien, I watched all those movies in the theater, the original Lord of the Rings movies, and I always like was like, that was fine, but it never really got me. And then I watched, I think, one and a half of the Hobbit movies. I watched the first one, and then I, went, I had a friend who liked them more than I did, so I would go with him. I think I fell asleep during Desolation of Smog. And then I never saw uh, the third one at all. Which is the one with the big battle in it. I couldn't even be bothered. And this is like, this isn't even any of those guys. It's some assholes I'd never heard of from the second age. I don't even know what the fuck that is. Nobody's fucking... No, thank you. Uh, it'll be on this. The stream will be on this channel. It'll be Chapo. The highest score I've ever bowled. That's an interesting question. One, I think I had like one, 230 one time. I got around 230. That's definitely the best I ever did. That was wild. But most, usually I'm sub 100. I don't know. Maybe it wasn't 2.30. It's been a while. 
That sounds high now that I think about it. 300 is the best. Was it that high? It was like 180. To, I don't know. It was, it was in the high. It was around 200. I don't know. I'm terrible at chess. I'm awful at chess. One of the worst at chess. Also, you can't bust my balls for being bad at bowling. I'm literally disabled, okay? That's fucking ableism. Um, I'm terrible at chess. I make moves that s always lead in disaster. And I, I honestly, my fiance Amber pointed out kind of why this happened. Is that I hate having to choose cho to make a move. I hate it. I'm a Libra. I hate it. And so I think what I do is I subconsciously pick the move that will make me lose as fast as possible so that I have to stop thinking about it. Because it's like, it's just, that kind of me is like hell, having to make like very consequential decisions that I am not confident about. I'm a big, uh, yeah, there's a reason that this is what I do, that I don't actually like have any responsibilities because I'm not built for it. I mean, maybe that'll change. Probably will in my lifetime. We'll see. Might have to make some changes. But uh, situations will dictate that. I can't really try to force it. I think for me, it's just like, it, 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 it's, it's, it's not so much anxiety of making the choice of which, which way to go as it is like, I don't know why one is better than the other. And so it annoys me. Yeah, I'm definitely more of a Trotsky. Stab me in the head. All right, so this is an hour. Finished it up. So next week, we'll be back with chapter, the next two chapters, chapters three and four. Chapter three are about those disgusting monsters, the Dutch. And then chapter five is about the, 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 the reptiles, the, the people who, like, discovered an ancient obelisk while digging around in their countryside and then we're all enthralled to its evil power the british whose uh whose demonic enthronement in the world we have only ever uh we've never escaped all america ever did was uh was just take over leadership of a machine uh, built there on that fucking becursed isle but on foundations made by those hustling scratchy scrappy dutch all of whom, of course, did their uh, success win on, you know, piles and piles of corpses. So next week, we'll talk about that. Bye-bye. Stay cool.